19-year-old Charles Starkweather and 14-year-old Carol Ann Fugate. In the 1950s, they murdered 11 people in Nebraska and Wyoming over the period of just two months. Things didn't work out between them and they were arrested when a deputy sheriff found the pair wrestling by the side of the road. Fugate ran towards him for help and screamed, he's going to kill me. Later at the station, it all became clear who the sheriff had actually arrested. Aged just 20 years old Starkweather was executed, he told his father, if I want to make my atonement with God and be electrocuted, that's my business. Fugate now lives in Michigan with a new identity. The character that you usually see is a sporadic nature, it's too fantastic for reality. He does many things that the character shouldn't do. I tell them, and I don't know why. Well, you know, you can show me this thing. No, not really, because I'm going to be famous for all time, just like my idol James. Charles Raymond Charlie Starkweather was an American spree killer who murdered 11 people in Nebraska and Wyoming between December 1957 and January 1958. When he was 19 years old, he killed 10 of his victims between the 21st of January and the 29th of January 1958, the date of his arrest. During his spree in 1958, Starkweather was accompanied by his 14-year-old girlfriend, Carol Ann Fugate. Both Starkweather and Fugate were convicted on charges for their parts in the homicides. Starkweather was sentenced to death and executed 17 months after the events. Fugate served 17 years in prison, gaining release in 1976. Starkweather's electrocution by electric chair in 1959 was the last execution in Nebraska until 1994. Charles Starkweather was born in Lincoln, Nebraska, the third of seven children of Guy and Helen Starkweather. The Starkweathers were a working class family. His father Guy was a mild mannered carpenter who was often unemployed, due to suffering rheumatoid arthritis in his hands. During Guy's periods of unemployment, Helen supplemented the family's income working as a waitress. Starkweather attended Saratoga Elementary School, Irving Junior High School, and Lincoln High School. In contrast to his family life, Starkweather later recalled nothing positive of his time at school. He was born with Genu Varum, a mild birth defect that caused his legs to be misshapen. He also suffered from a speech impediment, which led to constant teasing by classmates. As he grew older and stronger, the only subject which Starkweather excelled at was gym where he found a physical outlet for his rage against those who bullied him. Starkweather then began to bully those who had once picked on him. Eventually he felt rage against anyone he disliked. In this period as a young teenager, Starkweather went from being one of the most well-behaved teenagers in the community to one of the most troubled. 
his high school friend Bob von Busch would later recall. He could be the kindest person you've ever seen. He'd do anything for you if he liked you. He was a hell of a lot of fun to be around, too. Everything was just one big joke to him. But he had this other side. He could be mean as hell, cruel. If he saw some poor guy on the street who was bigger than he was, better looking, or better dressed, he'd try to take the poor bastard down to his size. Relationship with Carol Ann Fugate In 1956, the 18-year-old Starkweather was introduced to 13-year-old Carol Ann Fugate by her older sister, whom he had previously dated. He had dropped out of Lincoln High School in his senior year and was working at a Western Union newspaper warehouse. He sought employment there because the warehouse was located near Whittier Junior High School in Lincoln where Fugate was a student. Given his working schedule, Starkweather began to visit Carol Ann Fugate every day after school. He was considered a poor worker, his employer later recalled, sometimes you'd have to tell him something two or three times. Of all the employees in the warehouse, he was the dumbest man we had. Starkweather taught Fugate how to drive and one day she crashed his 1949 Ford into another car. However, Starkweather's father Guy was the registered owner of the vehicle. He paid the damages but argued with his son about it, and his having let his unlicensed girlfriend drive. Refusing to condone his son's behavior, Guy banished Starkweather from the family home. The young man quit his job at the warehouse and became a garbage collector at minimum wage. He began developing a nihilistic worldview, believing that his current situation was the final determinant of how he would live the rest of his life. He used his time on the garbage route to begin plotting bank robberies. He settled on a personal philosophy by which he lived the remainder of his time, dead people are all on the same level. First murder. Late on the 30th of November, 1957, Starkweather became angry at Robert Colver, a service station attendant in Lincoln, for refusing to sell him a stuffed animal on credit. He returned several times during the night to purchase small items, until finally, brandishing a shotgun, he forced Colver to give him $100 from the till. He drove Colvert to a remote area, where they struggled over the gun, injuring Colvert before Starkweather killed him with a shot to the head. 1958 Murder Spree On 21 January, 1958, Starkweather went to Fugate's home to get his girlfriend. Fugate's mother and stepfather, Velda and Marion Bartlett, told him to stay away. He fatally shot them then strangled and stabbed to death their two-year-old daughter Betty Jean. He hid the bodies behind the house. Starkweather later said that Carol was there the entire time, but she said that when she arrived home, Starkweather met her with a gun and said that her family was being held hostage. She said Starkweather told her that if she cooperated with him, her family would be safe, otherwise, they would be killed. The pair remained in the house until shortly before the police, alerted by Fugate's suspicious grandmother, arrived on 27 January. Starkweather and Fugate drove to the farmhouse of 70-year-old August Mayer, one of her family's friends who lived in Bennett, Nebraska. Starkweather killed him with a shotgun blast to the head. He also killed Mayer's dog. Fleeing the area, the pair drove their car into mud and abandoned the vehicle. When Robert Jensen and Carol King, two local teenagers, stopped to give them a ride, Starkweather forced them to drive back to an abandoned storm cellar in Bennett. He shot Jensen in the back of the head. He attempted to rape King, but was unable to do so. He became angry with her and fatally shot her as well. Starkweather later admitted shooting Jensen, but claimed that Fugate shot King. Fugate said she had stayed in the car the entire time. 
The two fled Bennett in Jensen's car. Starkweather and Fugate drove to a wealthy section of Lincoln, where they entered the home of industrialist C. Lauer Ward and his wife Clara Dot. Starkweather stabbed their maid Lillian Fenkel to death, then waited for Lauer and Clara to return home. Starkweather killed the family dog by breaking its neck, to keep it from alerting the wards. Clara arrived first alone, and was also stabbed to death. Starkweather later admitted to having thrown a knife at Clara, but insisted that Fugate had stabbed her numerous times, killing her. When Lauer Ward returned home that evening, Starkweather shot and killed him. Starkweather and Fugate filled Ward's black 1956 Packard with stolen jewelry from the house and fled. The murders of the Wards and Fenkel caused an uproar within Lancaster County. Law enforcement agencies in the region sent their officers on a house-to-house -house search for the perpetrators. Governor Victor Emanuel Anderson contacted the Nebraska National Guard, and the Lincoln Chief of Police called for a block-by-block -block search of that city. After several sightings of Starkweather and Fugate were reported, the Lincoln Police Department was accused of incompetence for being unable to capture the pair. Needing a new car because of Ward's Packard having been identified, the couple came upon traveling salesman Mel Callison sleeping in his bick along the highway outside Douglas, Wyoming. After Callison was awakened, he was fatally shot. Starkweather later accused Fugate of performing a coup de grace after his shotgun jammed. Starkweather claimed Fugate was the most trigger-happy person he had ever met. Fugate denied ever having killed anyone. The salesman's car had a parking brake, which was something new to Starkweather. While he attempted to drive away, the car stalled because the brake had not been released. He tried to restart the engine, and a passing motorist, geologist Joe Sprinkle, stopped to help. Starkweather threatened him with the rifle, and an altercation ensued. At that moment, Natrona County Sheriff's Deputy William Romer arrived on the scene. Fugate ran to him, yelling something to the effect of, It's Starkweather. He's going to kill me. Starkweather drove off and was involved in a car chase with three officers, Natrona County Sheriff's Deputy William Romer, Douglas Police Chief Robert Ainsley, and Converse County Sheriff Earl Heflin exceeding speeds of 100 miles per hour, 160 kilometers per hour. A bullet fired by Sheriff Earl Heflin shattered the windshield and flying glass cut Starkweather deep enough to cause bleeding. He stopped and surrendered. Converse County Sheriff Earl Heflin said, he thought he was bleeding to death. That's why he stopped. That's the kind of yellow son of a bitch he is. Trial and Execution Starkweather chose to be extradited from Wyoming to Nebraska. He and Fugate arrived there in late January, 1958. He believed that either state would have executed him. He was not aware, however, that Millwood Simpson, Wyoming's governor at the time, opposed the death penalty. Starkweather first said that he had kidnapped Fugate and that she had nothing to do with the murders. However, he changed his story several times. He testified against her at her trial, saying that she was a willing participant. Fugate has always maintained that Starkweather was holding her hostage by threatening to kill her family, claiming she was unaware they were already dead. Judge Harrier Spencer did not believe Fugate was held hostage by Starkweather, as he determined she had had numerous opportunities to escape. When Starkweather was first taken to the Nebraska penitentiary after his trial, he said that he believed that he was supposed to die. He said if he was to be executed, then Fugate should be also. Starkweather was convicted for the murder of Jensen the only murder for which he was tried. He was sentenced to death, and executed by the electric chair at the Nebraska State Penitentiary in Lincoln, Nebraska, 
at 12.04 a.m. on 25 June, 1959. He is buried in Wiyuka Cemetery in Lincoln along with five of his victims, including Mr. and Mrs. Kyle Ward. Fugate was convicted as an accomplice and received a life sentence on 21 November, 1958. She was paroled in June, 1976 after serving 17 and a half years at the Nebraska Correctional Center for Women in York, Nebraska. She settled in Lansing, Michigan. She changed her name and worked as a janitor at a Lansing hospital. Fugate married Frederick Clare in 2007. Apart from a radio interview in 1996, she has refused to speak of the murder spree. Carol Ann Clare was living in Stryker, Ohio, when she was seriously injured and her husband killed in a car crash on 5 August 2013. Victims Robert Colvert was 21 years, gas station attendant. Marion Bartlett was 58 years, Fugate's stepfather. Velda Bartlett was 36 years, Fugate's mother. Betty Jean Bartlett, Velda and Marion Bartlett's daughter, Fugate's half-sister. August Mayer was 70 years, Fugate's family's friend. Robert Jensen was 17 years, boyfriend to Carol King. Carol King was 16 years, girlfriend to Robert Jensen. C. Lauer Ward was 47 years, wealthy industrial. Clara Ward was 46 years, C. Lauer Ward's wife. Lillian Fenkel was 51 years, Clara Ward's maid. Mel Callison was 34 years, traveling salesman. Starkweather also killed two family dogs of people that he murdered. Depictions in media. Representation in film and television. The Starkweather Fugate case inspired the films The Sadist, 1963, Badlands, 1973, California, 1993, Natural Born Killers, 1994, and Starkweather, 2004. A case study of two savages a 1962 episode of the TV series Naked City, was also inspired by the Starkweather killings. The 1968 first season Robert Stack segment episode, The Bobby Currier Story, of the name of the game, was also based on these events. The made-for-TV movie Murder in the Heartland, 1993, is a biographical depiction of Starkweather with Tim Roth in the starring role. Stark Raving Mad, 1983, a feature film starring Russell Fast and Marcy Severson, is a fictionalized account of the Starkweather Fugate murder spree. Dot, citation needed. The Peter Jackson film The Frighteners, 1996, features a Starkweather-inspired killer who goes on a similar murder spree, and has a female accomplice. The fourth episode. Dangerous Liaisons, aired the 2nd of September, 2010, of season 3 from the ID series, Deadly Women, covers the murders. Teenage Wasteland, the season 4 premiere episode, aired the 6th of December, 2016, from the ID series A Crime to Remember, also covers the Starkweather Fugate murder spree. Literature Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers 1994, starring Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis as two young, attractive serial killers who engage in a killing spree was inspired by the crimes of real-life teenage serial killers, 19-year-old Charles Starkweather and 14-year-old Carol Ann 